Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, again, we're going through a quick ergonomic screen. Um, so this is really just a quick screening tool to get you started on what areas might need to be assessed in the future or what might be problem areas that you'd wanna look at. So really just wanted to start with the basic steps to begin. Um, your first step would be just to gather some data. So before you even go out to the production floor or look at the area that you're considering, you'd want to have a couple conversations and gather some data. So that would include, I always look at injuries. Um, what's your history with injuries with this area? If you have an early reporting strategy, what symptoms um, are coming into you as far as body parts or um, symptoms? So sore shoulders, sore backs. Um, feet are sore, things like that. Um, you'd also want to talk with HR or safety, depending on your role in the company, um, and just make that connection. Sometimes HR has a very hard time um, staffing a certain area. That's something you'd want to consider. Perhaps there's an ergonomic reason that when we hire someone, they leave within a week or two. Um, your second step, which is very, very important, is really talk to the employees. Do a survey, do some interviews, talk to people. Ideally, you're gonna to talk to the majority of the people that work in that area. Um, your best ergonomist is probably going to be the employees that work in that area or at that station. So ask them questions like, what's the worst part of your job? What's the most challenging part of your job? Um, what are some things that you would like to change? Do you have ideas, recommendations, suggestions for how we could make this job easier for you? Um, and talk to more than just one person. Um, really get the word out from someone that's been there for a long time to that really brand new employee. Um, you'll get a lot of information from that interview and survey. Um, and now you're ready to go out to that production floor and really observe that work process. A couple things you want to bring with you when you head out. Um, my recommendation is to take a tape measure, a notebook. Um, you're going to want to take some pictures and some video, and I, re I do recommend both. Um, take a stopwatch with you so that you can time a specific work process or perhaps one work cycle, depending on your area. Um, and then while you're observing the things that we're going to talk about today, think about, is this a choice? that the employee is making, or is this what the job requires them to do? And that's an important distinction. What I mean by that is um, if an employee is choosing to carry something instead of the cart that's right there, um, if they're choosing to bend down um, to the floor instead of using the tool that they're supposed to be using, um, start to ask some of those questions. Why did you make that choice? Um, perhaps they don't know where that tool is. Perhaps it's perceived as being quicker or easier. So your ergonomic screen, um, you're going to want to really focus in on the most challenging part of the job, according to that employee interview. So what's the part of this job that keeps coming up that people don't like, they have suggestions for, it's awkward, something like that, something they'd like to change. The things that you're going to look at are here listed on your screen. So you're going to be looking at reach, their sitting or standing position, lifting, any push, pull, carry, material handling, uh, movement, and then what I'm calling multipliers, things that are going to make those factors more of an ergonomic risk. All right, so let's dig in. So for reach, what are we looking for? Really, ideally, you're looking for anything over a 24-inch reach or beyond the length of that employee's fingertips when their arm is fully extended in front of them. A really good way to make this very visual is if you have an employee at their workstation tuck their elbows at their side and swing their hands um, in and out so it makes kind of an arc. That is your ideal frequent reach distance. Past that, they can do that occasionally, sometimes throughout their day, but it's not ideal. So if there are things that they need to use frequently that are outside that distance at their work table or workstation, then that's something that you'd want to look at. So reach can sometimes look like leaning forward, um, being on their tiptoes, um, things like that. It's not just a straight out reach. Um, keep in mind things that they might need to reach forward, up, out, or down for. For example, um, a bin or a Gaylord where they have to pack things down to the bottom of it. If it's a very deep 
um, Gaylord or Bin, and they have to reach down to that bottom level, that is, in that is included in your reach. So look at some of those types of tasks too. Um, you see two pictures here where reach is maybe something we'd wanna take a look at. Um, you can see one employee, she's having to reach over a bin that's on the floor to get what she needs out of that oven. Okay, sit or stand. Um, this is one of my favorite ones to look at, and it's probably one of the easier ones to point out. Um, sitting or standing position. Um, the things you want to look at is, do they have a chair if they're in a seated position? Is it in good working order and with appropriate features for the tasks? And what I mean by that is armrests, um, a foot ring, um, height adjustability, a back. Um, maybe it's just a stool. So take into account what are the features that are currently being offered with the chair at that position, um, at that workstation, and is that is that appropriate? Is it in good working order? Chairs these days do not last very long, <laughs> um, and they can get pricey. So just be prepared for that. If you're looking at a chair that you bought maybe five years ago for around $100, most likely it needs to be replaced. Table, height adjustable tables, um, very important. Um, provides you with the most opportunities for sitting or standing throughout the employee's workday. And of course, we always want to address what are they standing on? Is the size, the shape, the condition, and the features appropriate for that task? Um, Acromat has lots of options for really customizing that work area to have a map that meets those needs. Um, for example, things that make sure their toes are not hanging off the end of the mat, make sure they have that yellow strip where they are transitioning on and off from concrete to the, to the mat. Um, if you have a combination area, which is in a lot of ways ergonomically ideal, meaning they can sit or stand throughout their day, they need appropriate chair, they need an appropriate table and an appropriate surface that can handle all of that. Lifting. Um, lifting gets a lot of attention and yes, it is something that you'd want to address. Really what you want to look for is are they within their power zone for the start and the end of the lift? Power zone is defined as between their waist and their shoulders. Um, so if they are lifting, for example, above that or below that, that's something that you'd want to address. Why is that happening? Um, these two pictures here indicate some things that might make you go, hmm. Uh, so pallets are a great example if they're just on the floor. Um, and for example, in that picture on the left, that employee would have to stand on the outside of that pallet and reach forward to get that bin off of that pallet. Um, and then they would have to um, lift it down from that height. If they're loading the pallet, they would have to bridge that gap and reach forward um, at a chest or shoulder height lift. Now, keep in mind, we have different size employees. So we have tall people, short people, and everything in between. Um, so as much adjustability that you can have in your facility and on the production floor is really important. And it's for things like sit, stand, lift. Push, pull, carry. Uh, so my recommendation is that when you're looking at push, pull, carry for load, um, load management, you'd want to look at what is being moved, why is it being moved, and how is it being moved. That can really begin to guide um, what that work process looks at and or looks like and what types of things we need to pay attention to. So whether we're moving, in this example, water bottles, or we're moving bags of materials, or we're moving boxes, um, what is the weight of that? How much does that weigh? Um, why are we moving it from this area to that area? Why are we carrying it? Or are we pushing and pulling it on some sort of cart or pallet jack or something like that? Um, so that pulls in that how piece. So looking at the equipment that might be utilized in that. So just really understanding that piece. Um, an additional thing um, to look at for push, pull, carry is how often. Um, is this something that they do once a day? Is this something that they do every hour? Is this something that they do every minute? That is going to guide your um, assessment of that area as well. Okay, your multipliers. These are the big three that really will increase risk for musculoskeletal disorders force, repetition, and position. So by force, I mean, if they are having to lift 
a very heavy weight. Um, generally, anything over about 50 pounds is really going to be a problem, um, depending on the type and, and size of that item. Again, repetition, like I mentioned in the last slide, are they doing this once a day? Are they doing this once an hour? Are they doing this once a minute? The repetition will always increase your risk for musculoskeletal disorders. And then position. So an awkward position or a position that's um, out of a neutral posture, um, then that's something that you'd want to look at as well. So neutral postures include um, a neutral wrist position, um, a good hand grip, um, being able to get into a good position for a lift, meaning you're able to get into a squat position. Um, so the, any of those three that jump out at you, you'd want to pay attention to those as well in your ergonomic screen. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to some solutions for each of these factors. Okay, so going back to reach, um, some simple solutions, some are more complicated than others as we go through these. Um, obviously, depending on your budget, depending on your timeline, and depending on the results of your ergonomic screen or ergonomic eval, um, you these um, solutions kind of span all of those options. So. Uh, for reach, reducing the depth of the workspace. Now, this might seem counterintuitive because we think, oh, we want a really big desk for this workstation, or we want a really deep area because there's an important process that happens at this station. Well, when we have a really deep desk, um, the tendency is to push those items all the way to the edge of the desk. And then what we've all we've done is really increase that reach. So actually by putting some barriers in and having a narrow workspace, that may reduce reach. You can move the material closer, um, bringing those items close to that employee. Um, step up, meaning sometimes that employee um, tends to stand a bit of a ways back. Again, that's something sometimes you'd want to look at that work um, standing surface. If they don't have a mat that goes all the way up, um, that might be preventing that. And 5S, all your tools for the job in the right place at the right time um, is a really important part of this as well. So you can define those areas for reach distance through 5S process. Okay, next slide, please. Sit or stand. Okay, so that anti-fatigue mat with the appropriate size, shape, features is super important. Um, me, being able to really define that, again, um, you see some really unique options here for combination or sit-stand areas. Um, Acromat does a great job of really customizing to that area depending on what's needed. Um, so that's something that you'd always want to look at for that station. Again, a chair, repair, replace, assess, what are the features that are needed for this work task? Again, you can see in this example, those employees have just a stool um, that might be appropriate for them. If they're up and down from those stations frequently, that might be exactly what they need, um, but that takes some assessment. Height adjustable tables are my favorite. Um, they are so um, customizable to each employee that approaches that workstation, especially if you have a lot of rotation. Um, and that will give you a really good um, bang for your buck is height adjustable tables. My top three things to look for from a seated position. Um, if an employee is seated for the majority of their day or for a portion of that um, task, we wanna make sure that their feet are on the floor which sounds easy, but it is not. <laughs> that the top of a monitor or where their distance um, for gaze is, is at eye level. And that desk, if they're doing any sort of typing or writing or any, any key, keyboard work, that desk should be at or below their elbow height, which is lower than most people think of it. So those are my top three um, things to look for for a seated position. Lifting, always consider tools or equipment that may decrease the frequency of lifting, hoists, things like that, um, pallet jacks, um, forklifts, other alternate ways to lift. Um, sometimes that means if something has to be moved by an employee, sometimes you can label a shelf or even remove a shelf so that that appropriate start and end of lift is, is um, a kind of an easier um, uh, look for that employee. They know that this goes on this shelf and there isn't a bottom shelf or there isn't a top shelf for them to put it on because that's outside the scope of proper lifting. Um, and kind of a low cost option for lifting is label things. Um, 
something that just says heavy in big red letters or a shelf that says heavy items, um, colored tape, those can help with hazard awareness. If you don't already have a lift process or a lift um, standard, that's a policy that anything over this weight needs to be a two person lift. That can be hard to implement and it's a culture change, but it's something that might need to be done. Last, another option is always work with your vendors. If you have a box that's coming in that's way too heavy for your people, see if you can work, that, work with that vendor and get it into a smaller box, a smaller weight. Um, sometimes that is the best way to do it. Push, pull, carry. You're going to want to look at that what, when, why, and have those results really guide your workflow changes and your workspace changes. Um, so again, why are we moving that item? How often? Um, what is being moved? Those types of things. And really kind of thinking outside the box if there's something that we can do to change that work process. Maintenance and repair of wheels, super important. Um, so if we're talking carts, if we're talking pallet jacks, um, those types of things, taking a look at those wheels and having some sort of regular maintenance um, checkup so that every three months or every year or something like that, those casters get looked at, they get oiled down, they get rep repaired or replaced. Perhaps automating that item movement um, can be on your budget and, and that's a great way to remove that risk factor for your employees making sure you have the appropriate tool for the job. So whether that's a cart, a pallet jack, a conveyor, a hoist, um, those can really make a big difference in making sure that the, the tool is appropriate for that item and that task. For push and pull, um, make sure that you understand that the weight of the item is not what matters, but the force required to move the item is. As an ergonomist, if you wanted me to come in and take a look at push pull, I wouldn't mat it wouldn't matter what was on the cart, what would matter is how much force the employee needs to um, exude to move that item. So that's what we come in and measure, and that's how we make recommendations. So multipliers. Always look for ways to reduce or improve your force repetition or position. So whether that's engineering solutions or just flat out eliminating the hazard, um, those are definite drivers that you'd want to look at and, and see if you can reduce or improve those. Um, sometimes you can do that through job rotation, um, being able to have employees rotate from a standing position to a seated, seated position or a fine motor task to a gross motor task throughout their workday, or job expansion. Job expansion means that as part of this job, we are incorporating more areas in the, in the, work, um, in the workspace. So maybe part of their job is instead of just rotating to the shipping department, maybe that just becomes part of their position as well. Um, so those are two things that you can look at as well. Okay, that was a lot. <laughs> um, if you're looking for next steps, if some things come up during your quick screen and you're not, still not sure what to do, or perhaps you need buy-in from management or upper leadership um, for costly changes or to improve a certain area that you have determined is a, is a problem area, um, you can always have a professional ergonomist take your assessment to that next level. What they're going to be able to do is guide um, what is your best next step and what are some solutions and recommendations that they could give um, to help you use your resources and budget most appropriately. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Beth. A lot of great content covered there. So really appreciate that and some great takeaways that our audience will be able to implement in action. So really appreciate that. Um, it's always interesting to me, you know, anti-fatigue mats are a uh, a small part of ergonomics, you might say, but I think what you've highlighted here just shows how important it can be mm -hmm. as you think about designing your space um, to be most effective for your employees. So that was very helpful. I'll open the um, Q&A here and we can run through any questions anyone has. If there's still any other questions, feel free to put those in. So just give me a second. I'll stop the screen share and jump over to that. Um, the first question that had come in Beth, if you can help on this one, um, Teresa was asking, what role does shift length play in MSD development when workers stand for long hours? We see that sometimes, um, you know, the 10 hour shift on your feet, the whole of that shift. Help us on that one. Yeah, um, great question. 
Um, unfortunately, I don't know that I have a black or white answer for that. Um, I would say there's a lot of things that need to be addressed or looked at in those situations. Um, consider things like static standing, meaning there's just standing physically still in one place for long periods of time, or is it a dynamic stand, meaning they're taking a step one direction or another, perhaps a few steps in one, you know, one to a different work area at a time. Um, any changes of postures during that time, if they're able to squat, bend, um, do anything else, that's uh, that's beneficial um, if you're looking at a long shift like that. Um, ideally, they would be rotating every two to four hours. Um, but if that's not possibility, you'd want to take a look at for sure their standing mat. That's a great lead in to Acromat and all the options that they offer in the in that situation. Um, some other solutions might be being able to unweight one foot at a time onto a footstool um, where they're able to just kind of shift um, and have one foot up on a footstool for a period of time. You'd also want to look at if they have pedal use. Um, sometimes that um, is a factor in certain positions and that's something that they'd want to that you'd want to factor into that. So um, if you sit too too long, if you stand too long, if you lay too long, <laughs> anything that you do too long is at a higher risk for musculoskeletal issues. So we want to give employees as much changes of posture and position as possible. That's very good. I remember somebody told me once that the best position to be in is the next one. So that yes, confirms exactly. what you're saying. Exactly. <laughs> your best position is your next one. Absolutely. That's good. Excellent. Um, looks like one more question in here. A uh, question from John. John's asking, what do you recommend for exercise programs? We work 10 hour days. Many mm -hmm. of our soft tissue events are just weird. No two seem to be alike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Uh, give me a call. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, so stretch programs, or I call them dynamic movement programs are very, very important. They're kind of that last level of protection. If you can't engineer it out, if you can't um, have some administrative controls, this is something that you can do is have a culture of um, stretching and moving throughout your day. So um, at ErgoWorks, we have a proprietary program that we utilize at all of our client sites. Um, and we train employees not to just do it at the start or end of their shift. Those are great times, but so is the opportunity to do it throughout your workday as well. So we train our employees to utilize a dynamic movement program before they start a challenging work task or recover from a challenging work task. So really giving the employee those options to build it into their day. This isn't a 15 minute break. We're talking 15, 30 seconds where they take time to check in with their body, where they take a time to do a body scan and just check in what is sore and what do I need to do about it and then choose the appropriate dynamic movement. So when you have employees that are doing that routinely, that can be very helpful, um, but it, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of culture change um, and consistency. All right, one other question here. This one's from John and John's asking what strategies or tactics provide the most bang for your buck with, to reduce MSDs? Mm. Yeah, um, so I think going back to the slide that we had about sit or stand, my favorite bang for your buck is a height adjustable table. Um, that, that absolutely changes the job. Um, when that employee feels empowered to sit or stand throughout their day, um, and, and also I'm five, three on a good day. So if I'm following someone that is six, five, guess what? We are, do not have the same table height. Um, we do not have the same reach distance. Uh, we do not have the same things accessible to us. Um, so that height adjustable table allows for the hiring and the success of, of a wider population at your, at, at that workstation. So height adjustable tables, um, coupled with appropriate height adjustable chairs that are actually functioning and appropriate for that work task and workstation and anti-fatigue mats. Um, all those, all three of those things are an absolute game changer. So if you don't have those in right now, I would absolutely start with that. Excellent. I was talking to a um, safety leader just a couple of weeks ago at a med device manufacturing, and he was sharing with me how 
much of a difference they can see once they do implement some of these things, um, especially mm -hmm. obviously we, we do maths, so that's what we talk about, but um, mm -hmm. how much more engaged the employees are when there's a nice mat to stand on. It really does change um, some of these things that we've been talking about. So Absolutely. that's excellent. Absolutely. Um, looks like we can probably fit one more in. If that's, is that all right with you, Beth? Yeah, of course. All right, cool. Um, Michael is asking, how can we quantify the risk of MSD to gain corporate buy-in to make ergonomic changes? That's actually a, a great question. I think um, be glad to hear what you say on that one. Yeah, I think um, I would recommend that you do the quick screen that we talked about, look at those problem areas, circle back with management um, and have an ergonomist come out because um, the ergonomist is really going to do an industry standardized tool um, and they're going to apply it to that work task or that workstation and be able to quantify the risk. They're able to say this is high ergonomic risk, this is low ergonomic risk. They may also be able to kind of do a what if analysis. So if we changed this one thing, or we if we were able to lower this, raise this, adjust this one thing, um, what do those results look like? Um, where you went out initially and took those pictures and took that video, they're able probably also to have kind of a before and after. So being able to show and really give the cost savings from a risk reduction perspective of making that ergonomic change is, I have found is helpful when telling management, look, we need to change this process or we need to buy this pallet um, rotation or something like that, a specific piece of equipment. So having that ergonomist come out can be really helpful in, in kind of paving the, the way for that change. That's great. I think you mentioned at the beginning that sometimes when you're talking to the employees, they can be your best advocates or your best ergonomists. And mm -hmm. we find that so much as well. And mm -hmm. that, do you think that could play into this, have, have upper management, have those that are making the decisions actually speak to those involved oh gosh, yes. and, and standing on the floor or doing these tasks it they can they can say it exactly how it is from experience of doing the job yes exactly and i think i it, it really depends on your facility and kind of what that interaction looks like sometimes upper management who makes those decisions about the the dollars don't really have a lot of interaction with the employees, you know, on a let's t sit down and talk about this perspective. And sometimes they do. So depending on where your company is at in that spectrum, um, I would use that to your advantage. Um, if you need someone to come in and say, here is the cost of this ergonomic risk for injuries, um, mostly what we're talking about with changes is a lot cheaper than one sprain or strain injury per OSHA guidelines. So one sprain or strain injury can be thirty to forty thousand um, dollars. I'm guessing that what you're asking for is probably less than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so being able to quantify it with dollars and cents sometimes means a lot to that upper management. That's very true. We actually had that testimonial from a safety leader recently too. He said that they had one injury and he told me that they could have replaced their entire facility with premium matting for less than the cost of what this one took to resolve. So 100%. So true. I, Excellent. So true. Mm -hmm. 